Okay, good morning everyone. I see you're all kind of popping up in the comments there. So I see Cindy's here, good morning. Uh, Casey's here again, good morning. Good morning again, Karen. Uh, good morning, Shafan, how's it going? Lim is here and Jenna and Mashid. hello, hello, hello. Ella's here, good morning or good evening, Ella, whatever time it is for you. Um, Ying is here, good morning. Faye's here, hello, Min. Hello, Lily. Hello, Pearly. Uh, Tisa, good morning. Okay, so how many people do we have? 16 people are showing up. Michael's here. Good morning, Michael. Um, so like I mentioned in social justice um, as well, We'll, we'll probably start just a little bit earlier. I know I'm sort of starting around 8.10 and we're still kind of just getting into this weird mode of education. So we'll, we'll probably start a few minutes earlier um, next week. But again, we're just kind of getting used to things. Adalbert's here. Good morning. Good morning, Jimmy. Um, yeah, so we'll start a little bit earlier um, going forward, but we're, we're still getting warmed up. So... Today what we'll do is um, we'll continue talking about human culture and yeah, we'll continue talking about human culture because there's, there's still a lot to talk about and I think that it is, um, it would really be impossible to understate how important culture is to human beings in terms of um, just our success as a species and as what uh, in terms of what we have been able to do over our history and what we might be able to do in the future um, culture is a massive massive part of that uh, and so there's there's no way to sort of sell short its importance in terms of what humans are and what humans do um, all right so lots of people here let's um, let's dive right in shall we so yesterday um, we started off talking about anthropology and we said that anthropology was um, the study of humans in general. The, the big question of anthropology is what is it to be a human being? What does it mean to be a human? What are humans like? Um, why do humans do the things that they do? Um, all of those things are questions that anthropologists try to answer every day. Uh, and so we talked about s some of the subfields that anthropologists find themselves in, um, physical or biological anthropologists who look at um, humans as physical organisms, as animals, and they look at how we work as biological organisms and how our bodies work. We talked about social or cultural anthropologists who visit um, contemporaneous or modern cultures and try to describe how those cultures work and document them. Um, we said that there was linguistic anthropologists who, uh, oh, Carmen's here, good, good morning, Carmen, and Manish and Peter are all here, good morning, good morning, good morning. Um, we've talked about linguistic anthropologists who study human language and how it is created and how it's used and looking at language in terms of how you can use it to determine other things about human behavior. Um, and then finally, we talked about archaeology. Uh, archaeology looks at human cultural behavior in the past. And so archaeologists commonly dig things out of the ground that are left behind from humans hundreds or thousands or even tens of thousands of years ago, actually even millions of years ago. Uh, and from what's left behind, archaeologists try to figure out what humans were doing and why okay and so um in this course we'll probably hmm well we'll definitely be looking at some social and cultural anthropological knowledge um, archaeology will contribute a lot to what we know about earlier civilizations uh, we'll talk a little bit about human language as we go forward as well um, and we will talk about um we might even talk about a little bit, well, yeah, we'll talk about a little bit of physical or biological anthropology. So all of these sort of sub-disciplines will contribute to some of the things we talk about uh, in this class. Um, 
So yesterday we were talking about what culture was and we talked about why it was so important. And so I made this kind of analogy or comparison to human babies um, as computers without operating systems. Um, culture is basically our operating system and without it, uh, humans don't really know how to do anything. Um, culture is something that ultimately completes us as humans. Um, I think I said to you yesterday that humans are kind of special amongst animals because a huge amount of our brain development happens not before birth, but after birth. Um, and so our brains continue to develop as we grow and really all the way, um, all the way into our 20s. Um, humans have an incredibly long childhood. Um, and that's not just because we live about 80 or 100 years. Um, if you correct for the difference in lifespan, you'll see that humans have a very, very long childhood um, to the point where all of you who are listening to me right now, um, your brains are still developing and changing and growing even now. And so you have all spent 16, 17, 18, 19 years developing your brains and you're not done, right? You're, there's still things happening up there. Um, that's an incredibly long time for a species to kind of be in a growth phase, but that's kind of how humans work. We have very, very long childhoods. We have very, very long periods of brain development. And the learning of culture is an important part of that development. Uh, and I don't think we'll have time to get into it here because it's kind of complicated, uh, but very interesting. Um, in fact, without learning certain things, uh, for instance, language, um, your brain actually will not develop the way that it should. And so not only is culture something we need to learn to survive and to communicate with each other, but it's actually the learning of culture and the learning of social behaviors is actually important to the development of our brain. So your your brain will not wire correctly if you are not taught things at an early age, if you're not taught human language and if you're not interacted with. And so in a very real sense, um, culture is something that completes us just like an operating system, but it's actually, it's actually more than an operating system um, because in our case, the operating system actually contributes to the development of our hardware, right? Of our physical brains. Again, we don't, we don't really have time to get into that, but it's super interesting. Um, yeah. Hello. Uh, oh, Sam's here too. Good morning, Sam. Uh, let's see. Yeah. And <clears throat> so I said that we all undergo this process of learning human culture and we don't really have a choice in it. We are born into a culture and that culture is sort of downloaded into us by our parents and our grandparents and our siblings and people around us in society. They all help to teach us this uh, way of being and way of knowing things. And I said that because so little of human behavior is actually pre-wired, everything, basically everything we do is a cultural act. Um, even something so boring as brushing your teeth in the morning. Um, it's, it's not a biological human instinct to brush your teeth. It's something that you have been taught to do. And so basically everything, almost everything that we do and say and think and feel, all of those things happen in a way that culture has taught us to do. And so, like I say, there's no, there's no way to underestimate how important human culture is. Um, so yesterday we also defined what, what we were talking about when we talked about culture. And we said that it was a system of shared beliefs and values and customs and behaviors and things and artifacts that are common to members of a single 
society. Okay. That's kind of, uh, that's about where we ended off, almost where we ended off. Um, and we said that often the things that we think about when we think about human culture, um, those are kind of the, the surface, the surface part of culture, right? The, the way people dress, the language they speak, the kind of foods they eat or the religious celebrations they engage in. Um, those are all really surface things. The really kind of interesting part of culture is the stuff that is not immediately visible. Um, the kind of ideas they have about how the world works, the kind of ideas they have about who people should be. <clears throat> Excuse me. Excuse me. Um, the kind of ideas they have about who people should be. So what is what does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be a woman? Um, <clears throat> ideas about children and how they should be raised. Um, how should we treat our elders? What does it mean to be a hero? Right? What what is what is a hero? That's something that is culturally determined. And so the deeper we get into culture, the more um, kind of powerful some of these ideas become. And again, they <clears throat> pattern the way that we interact with the world and they pattern the way that we see the world as well. Um, good morning, Aliana. That's okay. Don't, don't worry about it. Glad you're here. Um, <clears throat> so culture is something that is not only important for our brain development and important for our success as a species, but it teaches us how to interact with our environment, our physical environment and our social environment. And we said that the social part was particularly important because um, as some of you suggested yesterday, humans are, are social creatures, right? We don't live off on our own in the mountains like a hobbit, not like a hobbit, like a, who am I thinking of? <clears throat> uh, like a golem or a smeagol, right? We don't, we don't live off in the mountains alone by ourselves. Um, we're social creatures, right? We live in large groups. And so in order to do that, we need to have standards of behavior, right? We have to find a way to work together and allow our individual wants to balance out the good of the group, right? And um, culture is what helps us do that. I said yesterday that humans were kind of unique in that they can cooperate flexibly and in large numbers. And that's something that most animals can't do. Some animals are very good at cooperating in a flexible way. And so wolves are like that. Um, killer whales are like that, chimpanzees are like that, but those animals can't really cooperate that way in large groups. And some animals can cooperate very well in large groups like termites or bees or things like that, but they're not very flexible in the way that they operate. They can really only cooperate in one way. Humans, I mentioned, can cooperate in huge numbers. And um, I mentioned yesterday that Canada can be thought of as a way in which humans cooperate, right? There's 36 million of us. We don't really know each other, but we have figured out a way to cooperate within this country to make it work and to hopefully get everyone the things that they need. It's not a perfect system of cooperation, but it does work. Uh, and that's pretty amazing for a community of animals, 36 million of us, can actually cooperate towards a single goal. That's incredibly, incredibly important um, to the success of human beings. So not only are we very intelligent creatures, but we also know how to pool our efforts. We know how to cooperate with each other. Okay, so <clears throat> that was yesterday. New stuff for today. Um, there's four characteristics that I want to talk about here in terms of what culture is and how cultures work. Um, and so the four, as you can see on the screen here, one is that culture is symbolic. Um, as I'll mention, yeah, I'll, I'll explain it in a second. One is that culture is symbolic. Two is that culture is learned. Three is that culture is integrated. And the fourth one is that culture is shared. Okay, and I'll explain these kind of one at a time. Now, the first part of culture is that cultures are highly, highly symbolic. And so 
humans communicate with each other in ways that use one thing to represent something else. That's basically what a symbol is, right? And so I could put up all of these on the screen and all of these are symbols, right? They represent something else. And so we'll look, some of us will look at these or most of us will look at these and we'll very easily pick out, you know, the McDonald's symbol, the Apple symbol, uh, Target is there and Nike. Um, there's a swastika, there is a, a Shinto shrine, uh, there's sort of a yin and yang, there's, uh, there's the symbol of Islam there with the crescent moon and the star, uh, there's the star of David which represents um, Jewish people in Judaism, there's the Om sign, uh, <clears throat> there's a little below, there's the Superman sign, uh, below the Superman there's a, a symbol of the medical field uh, which is Hermes's wings and staff, I believe. Oh, I always forget that one. Uh, there's the symbol for um, the Sikh religion there. There's the biohazard symbol. All of these little symbols represent something larger than themselves, right? And so if I looked at the Superman symbol, for instance, um, we look at that and of course we know it's associated with a comic book or movie character. We know that this character wears that symbol on his chest as part of his superhero outfit. Um, but that symbol carries a lot of meaning, right? If you think about what kind of person Superman is and what, what kind of things he does, um, <clears throat> Superman is strong, right? Superman is arguably brave. Superman um, uses his powers to help people, right? To protect people who are weaker than himself. Um, he symbolizes justice or goodness. Um, to some people, he is associated with America, right? Because he's an American superhero. Um, all of those things are associated with Superman. And so when you look at that symbol, not only do we think of the comic book hero, but immediately we make associations to all of those other characteristics, right? His strength, um, his exceptionality, his helping of people who are vulnerable and saving them from death or whatever. We associate all of those things at the same time. And so that's kind of how symbols work. Symbols communicate um, a significant amount of meaning in a very small package. And of course, all of these things do just that, right? Um, the Apple symbol, if you look at it, yes, we know they make computers and um, phones and things like that, but we also know them to be uh, very focused on design, right? Um, in many cases, they're very trendy. They're a very successful and powerful company. Um, and so when we see that symbol, we not only know what it's associated with, but there are characteristics that we immediately associate with it as well, okay? So symbols are something that represents something else, but they carry a lot of meaning. And again, humans, um, humans communicate in symbols all the time. Um, I'm doing it right now. Um, here I am with sounds coming out of my mouth and all of these sounds are symbols, right? If I say cup, that is a sound, that's a symbol for this thing right here, right? We've all agreed that that's what a cup is, and so when I say that word, you immediately know what I'm talking about. And so all of these words coming out of my mouth are symbols, basically, and you are sitting, or at least I hope you're sitting on the other end, and you're interpreting those symbols, right? You know what they mean. Um, we communicate with hand gestures, right? If I give you the thumbs up, we know what that means, right? That gesture carries certain meaning, right? It means okay or good job or something like that, right? There's other parts of the world where that gesture means um, something less good. We don't, we won't, don't need to talk about that. Um, but again, we communicate with each other all the time symbolically, okay? Now, 
those are kind of modern modern examples i guess of um symbols and how symbols work but let me talk about one that's kind of more anthropological i guess or at least one outside of um outside of our cultures so the people here that you see on the screen are the Kwakwakwak, and they are an indigenous uh, a group of indigenous people that live here in british columbia um, they live a little bit up the coast from vancouver and so if you go to kind of the north tip of Vancouver Island uh, and sort of on the mainland coast across from it, you'll find their sort of traditional territory. Um, Kwakwakwak people have probably been in that area for thousands of years. Um, they were here, of course, before Europeans came to North America. They were here before Brit British Columbia was a province uh, and they're they're the original peoples of um, that part of the world. Um, we'll talk about these people a little more in a little more detail later, but for now I'll just touch on them to illustrate my point about symbols. Um, oh yeah, so I have a little map here. You can see the the Kwakwakwak traditional territory in green um, just around the top part of Vancouver Island. And while we're looking at this map, Maybe I'll point out to you as well how many different cultures actually traditionally lived within British Columbia itself. Um, if you know anything about Canada and if you know anything about Canada's First Nations people or Canada's Indigenous people, um, often we kind of talk about them as if they're one group, but that's not very accurate. In fact, there are many, many Indigenous cultures that were traditionally spread across what's now Canada. And so here on this map, you can see um, easily about 10 or 12 different cultures that traditionally li lived just in this part of British Columbia, never mind the rest of Canada or the US or South America. Um, so Canada originally was a very culturally rich area. And so the Kwakwakwak are just one culture in a, um, in a large group. But anyway, um, traditionally speaking, the Kwakwakwak are hunters and gatherers. We'll talk about this a little bit more next week. And so they didn't do any farming. They didn't really keep any animals like pigs or goats or chickens or anything like that. Um, they had dogs, but their food came from the natural world. And so they hunted and they fished and they gathered. Um, traditionally, they would have lived in really large wooden houses like this. And so you can see in this photo, it's a pretty old photo actually, I think it's from the late 1800s, but you can see these very large wooden houses that they would have built. Uh, and you can see some of their boats uh, that they built uh, just down on the, the shorefront there. Uh, I'll show you this too. This is from a museum exhibit, uh, so it's not real, but it's a little easier to see what a Kwakwakwak village might have looked like right and you can see that um, these houses are kind of really large and well built and uh, they're painted on the front with symbols right they've they've got artwork you can see some totem poles um, placed along the front of the village and so it, <clears throat> if you are in Vancouver and you've done any walking around you'll probably uh, you'll have seen totem poles in various places we'll talk about the symbology of those a little bit later um, and so this is kind of a, this is kind of the, the lifestyle that these people led, living in these um, living in these kind of large villages for part of the year, um, hunting and fishing and gathering. Um, again, for thousands of years before Europeans showed up here. Now, the reason I kind of bring these people up is to illustrate symbolic the symbolic nature of culture and so some anthrop uh, some anthropologists will often talk about key metaphors within a culture okay and a key metaphor is a symbol that sort of dominates people's understanding of the world and for the Kwakwakwak their key metaphor is can be seen as hunger okay now let me just think for a second. Should I tell you this now or later? 
I'll tell you it later. Okay. Now, their key metaphor is hunger. And so one of the ways that you can actually see this symbolically shown is in their artwork. Um, so here we have a number of Kokwakuak masks. Um, traditionally, these people would use them in rituals and celebrations. And so people would wear these uh, masks on their head and sometimes they'd have other parts of a costume as well uh, to make themselves into um, a bird or a wolf or a bear. Um, the one in the bottom right, that's kind of a mythical creature called a wild man of the woods, which looks particularly terrifying. Um, but what you can see about these masks is that they all have really kind of big mouths and really lots of teeth. And so if you read some of the, uh, if you know some of the Kwakwakwak mythology, if you know some of the stories that they traditionally tell, um, there's lots of eating going on. There's lots of things being eaten by other things. Um, and certainly with this wild man of the woods um, in the bottom corner, um, the wild man will eat you if you kind of wander off into the woods. And so um, this sort of key metaphor of hunger is in part shown in their, in their artwork. We see lots of mouths, we see lots of teeth in their artwork. Okay, I'll come back to them in just a second. The second part of culture is that culture is learned. Okay, and so one of the terms that we will use in this course is enculturation. And so that's the process of transmitting um, culture from one generation to the next. And we said, of course, that we were all, we've all been part of that process already, and we still are, um, where our parents, where the older generation teaches us um, what we need to know. They give us cultural knowledge they download our cultural operating system into us. And again, all of us have undergone this process. Now, we can all think of ways in which this has, uh, this has occurred, right? So we can all think back and maybe our parents or our grandparents or other people in our family have directly taught us things. So they've said, you know, this is the right way to speak to your elders, um, this is how we pray, this is how we make this particular food, um, this is how you behave appropriately, right? We can think back, I'm sure, and remember times when our caregivers have given us specific cultural lessons. They've taught us how we should behave or how we should think or how the world works. That's, that's pretty easy to remember, but um, in some cases, the more interesting thing is to think about how those cultural references or how those cultural lessons are reinforced because within a culture we are taught lessons directly but then those lessons are reinforced uh, they're backed up in all sorts of interesting ways um, and so let me give you an example of that Now, I'm going to imagine that most of us know what this thing is, right? This is, this is a chessboard, right? Um, I'm just going to give my voice a rest for a second here. But in the comments, does anyone, anyone play chess? Are you good? Do you know how? Let me know if you can play chess. Give me a thumbs up. Or maybe two thumbs up if you're really good. Casey's good, okay. Good, we've got at least one chess player. That is chess. Okay, I'm not sure, Karen, if that means that you know how and you're not really good or if you don't know how, but that's okay. Um, Liana knows people who play, but not good, yes. Pearly knows the rules, okay. Lisa knows, good. Ella, not so much, okay sort of a mix but that's okay some people know how to play um 
if you oh Karen's not good at it okay neither neither am I Karen um, <clears throat> actually I, I know how to play it and I taught my not that bad Sam yeah um, I taught my dad how to play chess and he I taught him how to play and he beat me the second time the second time we played he beat me um, <clears throat> So I'm either like the world's worst chess player or I'm the world's best teacher. I think I'm going to I'm going to go for the second one because I I don't want to be the world's worst chess player. But either way, um either way I know how to play but I'm not very good at it. Uh Adalbert's, Albert knows how to play too. That's cool. Um Okay, so I'm clearly not a good chess player. Well, I guess I guess we'll find out, right, Eliana? Um Okay, so here we have a chess board, and most people would look at chess and just say, yeah, okay, it's a, it's a board game. I know how to play it, or I don't know how to play it. I like it, I don't. That's really m most of what people would think. But here, I wanna look at it through the eyes of an anthropologist, because everything within a culture is kind of in some way aligned with cultural values okay and so the reason why this game works or the reason why this game was created in the first place is has to do with the sort of cultural lessons that are sort of baked into it that we might not see if we don't look with the eyes of an anthropologist so an anthropologist might look at this board game here and they might say okay now what is the point of this game, right? What is the point of this game? Well, I think those of us who know anything about chess would say that the point of this game is to win it, right? There's there's two sides, right? Somebody has the, the black pieces, some people have the white pieces. You play the game and then the game ends when somebody wins, right? That's called um, That's called checkmate. You sort of back the other player's king into uh, into a space where the king can't move anymore and then that's called checkmate and you you win the game now to many people that might not sound like a very interesting insight right okay you the point of the game is to win that's not very exciting but it does tell us something because if you look at other cultures around the world when they play games the object is not always to win um, some cultures, for instance, when they play um, soccer or they play sort of a, a football-like game, um, the game is not over when someone wins. The game is over when the elders decide that the score is tied. When the elders decide that the score is tied, then the game is over. And so that's a very strong message, right? That the, the object of the game is not to win. The object is for everybody to enjoy themselves and to come out of it in an equal way, right? Which to some of us might sound um, appropriate and sort of normal. And to some of us that might sound completely bizarre, right? Why, why, would, you, why would you play a football or soccer game just to make sure that nobody wins, right? That for some of us that wouldn't make any sense at all. So the observation that the point of chess is to win um, is not that is not that mundane or unimportant it actually does tell us something about the culture that um, the culture that created this game winning is actually a desirable outcome it is important to it is important to win this game let me ask you a question here and you can put it into the comments um, how do you go about winning this game what do you need to do or be what's the what's the best way to win a game of chess what do you what do you need to be or need to do or what's important if you want to win a game of chess um, yeah you definitely need to get the king that's true right so according to the rules you have to corner the king and make sure that he that he doesn't move or he can't move. Um, 
what else do you think? How what's what's important if you want to win this game? What do you need to do? Um, Casey says, yeah, you need to you need to be strategic. Um, Aliana, yeah, you need to you need to achieve checkmate. Yeah, that's true. Casey says you need to have different strategies, right? So this is a game of strategy. It's being strategic. Um, you need to keep pressure on your opponent, right? So, um, and that in itself, I guess, is a strategy as well. Uh, a little bit of, a little bit of luck never hurts, right, Sam? A little bit of luck never hurts. Um, but I think you're right there. This is a game of not just luck, but this is a game of intelligence, right? This is a game of strategy. This is a game of, yeah, always keep your mind. You've got to stay focused. Um, uh, yeah, being smart and outplaying the opponent. Uh, or, <laughs> or find a bad chess player. Yeah, anyone want to play me? Um, yeah, find a bad opponent. Um, it's true if you want you can you can definitely do that um, but yeah this is a game of strategy this is a game of intelligence right so this this game shows that there is value to outthinking the other player right to being smarter and being more strategic and outthinking them right and so that might tell us that that's valued in the culture that created this game now, the other thing an anthropologist might look at, um, they might say, okay, well, we've got two sides here and they're lined up. And what happens? Well, these two sides kind of march at each other, right? And they kind of fight it out. And so it's kind of like a battle, like you see in Game of Thrones or whatever, right? Where there's a big line of soldiers on one side and a big line of soldiers on the other. And then somebody gives a very inspirational speech and then they go, ah, and everybody kind of charges and hacks each other to bits, right? That's how kind of traditional warfare works. But if you look at the chessboard, the chessboard is kind of a symbolic version of that, right? You've got two armies lined up across from each other and they're going to charge at each other and fight it out, of course, in slow motion and in a non-bloody fashion. But that's exactly what's going to happen. So this game, this chess game, is actually a metaphor for warfare, right? And so that might tell us something about the idea that warfare might be um, praised in the society that created this game. Warfare might be seen as a uh, as an important way to solve conflict. Certainly, if you're in a battle, you want to be strategic, and so that's the strategy is being worked into that as well. Um, so this game is not a metaphor for peaceful diplomatic negotiations. This game is a metaphor for war and for outthinking the other person in order to destroy them and basically kill their king. Right? That's how you succeed. Um, if we also look at the board here, those of us who either play chess or kind of know the rules to it, we'll know that there's a bunch of different pieces, right? And so in the front line there, you'll see a, um, there's, um, there's eight, little, eight little guys that all look the same, right? And so those are called soldiers or pawns or something else, depending on what part of the world you're in. And then behind them, there are some other pieces. There's two, uh, on the ends, there's two rooks or castles. Um, I think in India, they're, I'm not sure if they're elephants or camels. I think they're elephants. Um, here inside, you'll see knights. There's two little horsey guys called knights. Um, inside of those, there's two bishops, um, which again, I, I think are, I think are camels, but I'm not sure, somewhere else in the world. And then there's the king and the queen in the middle. And so, again, if you know anything about chess, you'll know that all of these pieces can move, um, can move in different ways, right? So 
the pawns or the soldiers in the front, we know that they can only really move one step at a time in a straight line. They can take two steps at the very beginning, but then just one step, one at a time. They can't go diagonally or sideways. They can't go back. They just go forward, right? Um, the castles or the rooks, we know they can move any number of squares in a straight line. For those of you who don't know how to play chess, you're getting a bit of a lesson here, but um, the knights or the horses, they kind of move in an L shape. They move three squares and then two. Uh, the bishops can move diagonally. Uh, the queen can go basically in any direction wherever she wants to go. Uh, and the king can go in any direction, but he can only go one square at a time, which is a little bit odd, but that's okay. Um, so fine, all of these pieces can move differently, but what's interesting is that all of these pieces represent positions in society, right? So all of these pawns, all of these soldiers are the regular people and the people behind them are people who are higher up in society, right? People who have more money and more power, right? Bishops and knights and kings and queens and things like that. Um, and so think of the sort of symbology of this. As a pawn, what are your options in life? Well, you get to fight for your king and queen and you just kind of march to your death, right? There's nothing you can do about it. You have no other options. You simply march along a square at a time until somebody kills you, right? Which is kind of depressing. Uh, if you're not a pawn, if you're a bishop or a knight or a queen, well, suddenly you have far more options, right? You have more options in society. You can move around more. You can do more things. Um, if you're playing the game, if you're playing chess, and your opponent can take either a pawn or let's say your queen, you always want them to take the pawn, right? You're never going to sacrifice your queen unless it's some sort of very complicated strategy that you have going on. But usually you're not going to, you're gonna try not to sacrifice your queen, you're going to sacrifice these little pawns or these little soldiers. And so what does that say? Well. It says that soldiers should sacrifice their lives for the queen or for people that are higher up in society. And so even though we might say, well, no, that it's just a game, but the society that created a game like this, the game makes sense because those are lessons that are that have already been learned in that society. Okay, so people who are kind of lower in the social pyramid, kind of regular people, often they don't have many options, right? And they are expected to lay down their lives for their rulers, right? Whereas rulers are not supposed to sacrifice their lives for the little people, right? Um, it's also commonly accepted that people who are higher up in society, those people have more power and more options and more flexibility in terms of what they do. People who are kind of on the bottom level of society, they don't really have all of those options, right? They kind of just have to trudge along and, you know, go to work every day at the factory and they don't really have any, um, any other options. And so the thing about the chess game is that it incorporates these kind of cultural lessons that people have already learned and reinforces them. And so for people who live in a society where those values already exist and those values have already been taught, the game reinforces what they already know. And the game makes it seem like that's exactly the way that the world works. And this is actually one of the important things about culture is that not only do we, we don't just learn a cultural lesson once, we learn it, but then we learn it again and again and again and again. Um, everything in our culture and our society reinforces that original lesson. And so because of that, it starts to feel as if that's actually the way the world is. That's the natural order of things. Um, and so 
all of these kind of cultural lessons and cultural ideas that we that are reinforced over and over again they become like a lens kind of like glasses that we look through and everything that we see around us we interpret through these cultural lessons that we have received okay and so the chess game is just one very small example of how cultural lessons can be kind of baked into other things in society other things within a culture and reinforce lessons that are more directly taught okay all right so I've got another example for you uh, that has to do with the Kwakwakwak, but I think um, I think that we should take a little break now because I would normally do that in a real class anyway. So let's take a 10 minute break here, stretch your legs, you know, you can go to the washroom or do whatever you need to do, um, and then we'll continue after the break, okay? So I'll just put a little timer up here, if I can. Put a little timer up and then um, yeah we'll start back in 10 minutes okay
Okay, good people. We are back. So, what are we talking about here? Well, we're talking about two aspects of culture. We're talking about how culture is symbolic, and we're talking about how culture is learned. And so, in the chess game here, we see kind of two of those things happening. We see that the game itself is a symbol for warfare, perhaps, or for um, the strategy of battle. But we also see a way in which cultural lessons are being communicated to people, but in a way that is not very obvious, right? And so the playing of this game reinforces other cultural lessons that people would have learned. And so we said some of those might be the importance of winning. Um, some of them might be this sort of appropriateness or effectiveness or desire to solve issues through warfare or simply seeing warfare as kind of glorious and triumphant. Um, it could have something to do with social structure. The idea that there are kind of different levels of society. Some people have lots of power and some people don't have lots of power. And the people who have power have more options and ability to kind of make moves and do things where as the little people don't really have that power. They just get to sort of move along and live their lives until they sacrifice themselves for their leaders, right? So again, you could argue, you could argue any of those points. You could say that, oh, that's not what chess is about, but those lessons are kind of encoded in the game. And again, for people who have absorbed those cultural messages, um, the game reinforces that and helps to um, it helps to enculturate people into a way of seeing the world, I guess. Okay, but let's have a look at a more anthropological situation here. So I'll bring you back to our friends, the Kwakwakiwak. So a First Nations people living in, uh, traditionally living in British Columbia. And here we see a photo from um, probably in the, hmm, when is this photo taken? I think this might be the early 1900s, but don't quote me on that. Um, and in this photo here, we see some people dressed up for a ritual celebration. And so you can see that there's some people standing in the back, but most of the people in this photo are wearing masks, right? So they wear these wooden masks and they've got these sort of um, costumes that go along with them. Now, imagine this, okay? So imagine we have a time machine or one of those time-space GPSs that Iron Man invents in Avengers. So let's say we have one of those and we can go back in time, all right? So in this case, let's imagine that we can all go back in time to a Kwakiwak village, let's say, hmm, let's say a thousand years ago, okay? So we go back to a Kokwakwak village about a thousand years ago. We're going to go back during the winter, so maybe it's December or January. Um, and that's the time when the Kokwakwak tend to gather together in large villages. Um, they gather together, often they have lots of their ceremonies and rituals at that time of the year because everyone is kind of together in one group. Um, that's the kind of the time of year where a lot of people get married because again, Lots of family groups are together, and so people will um, kind of exchange marriage partners at that time of the year. And so we're going to go back in time with our time space GPS about a thousand years, and we're going to land in this Kwakwakwak village. So I want you to imagine um, showing up at this village. Maybe it's it's in the evening, it's nighttime, so it's dark. And what we're going to do is we're going to go into one of those really large wooden houses, okay? Uh, the houses are really, really large. As I said, uh, multiple families actually would have lived in them. Uh, but we're going to go all the way in and there'll be kind of a ceremonial fire toward the back. And around this fire, lots of people are sitting. 
they're keeping warm, but they're also watching all of these um, ritual dances going on. And so here you can see um, a few people dancing uh, who are probably part of the Cannibal Bird Society. And so the Cannibal Bird Society is a secret society within um, Kukwakwak culture. And so you may have heard of secret societies before. Lots of cultures have them. And traditionally speaking, what they are is small groups of people who have specialized religious knowledge and they don't really share that knowledge with anyone else. Okay. And so again, lots of cultures have these little secret societies. Um, there's nothing kind of weird or bizarre or evil about them, but they do have specialized religious knowledge that they keep to themselves. And so here amongst the Kokwakwak, they have this cannibal bird society. And so on the night that we've gone back in time, we're going to see um, a ritual that brings a new member into this society. So a new young man will be um, incorporated into this group. So imagine this. We're sitting by the fire. All these Kukwakwak people are around us. And it's pretty quiet at the moment. Nothing's really happening. And then in through the door runs this young man, okay? And I want you to imagine this young man is entirely naked. He's covered in mud and sticks and things in his hair, and he's acting like a wild animal, okay? So he's clawing at people and biting at them and acting in a very savage manner, okay? And so he's acting in a very frightening way. Um, the people kind of get sticks and they hit him and they sort of drive him back out of the house into the woods, okay? Okay, so everyone kind of calms down and settles down, <clears throat> goes back to the fire. And then after a while, the young man runs in again. And same thing, he's kind of wild and crazy and clawing and biting at people. The people drive him back out of the house and into the woods, okay? But this time, they go to the edge of the woods and they leave a little bit of human food, okay? So maybe some dried salmon or some berries or nuts or something like that. They leave some human food for him. And so after a while, this young man kind of creeps forward and grabs the food and goes back into the woods. A little bit later, again, the young man comes running into the long house. Um, he's still kind of savage and wild and biting at people. The people drive him out of the house yet again. And perhaps they leave something else for him at the edge of the trees. So maybe a blanket to cover himself with. And so this happens a number of times. The young man comes running into the house. The people drive him back out. Um, and every time they leave a small gift, a small part of the human world. So maybe <clears throat> some shoes or a blanket or some food or something like that. Uh, and so every time this young man comes back into the house, he's a little less savage. He's a little less um, fierce. And eventually, he comes back into the house and he settles down by the fire calmly and, you know, like a, like a regular human. He's been tamed. He's been civilized. And so after that, um, the Cannibal Bird Society, they'll... Um, take this young man and they'll go away and they'll have a private dinner and then he'll be fully brought into um, the cannibal bird society. Now, all of us as foreigners, as visitors to this culture, we might look at each other after that ritual. We might say, that was totally crazy. That was really weird. What was going on with this young naked guy running around acting like an animal and biting people and what was up with that? What was going on? And for us, it would seem like a very strange event uh, because, of course, we haven't been enculturated in Kukwakwak culture, right? We don't understand the symbols. We don't understand the values and beliefs of what had happened there. But, of course, for the Kukwakwak people, they would look at that ritual and say, yeah, we get it. We know what's going on. Um, and here's what's going on. So 
for the Kwakwakwak people, I mentioned that they're hunters and gatherers. So they get their food from the natural world. They hunt for animals, they fish, uh, they collect shellfish and berries and things like that. And that's how they feed themselves. But specifically, they feed themselves in a way that they, for most of the year, they collect as much food as they possibly can, and then they store it away. So they dry, um, they dry their fish, <clears throat> excuse me, they dry their fish, they dry some of their meat, they dry out their berries and things like that. And they collect all of these things and save them away for the winter because in the winter there's generally less food available. Um, and so for the Kukwakawak, um, it's critically important that during the winter that they control their hunger, right? Because they are living on the food that they have stored, that they've put away from earlier in the year. And so, you know, if in November you decide that you're just going to pig out and eat all of your food, then you're going to run out by the end of the winter and then you're going to starve and die. So it's very important for the Kwakwakwak to control their hunger, right? To control, um, to, to ration their food. Um, and so what's happening here in this sort of strange ritual that we've seen is the same thing. Um, the young man that comes running in and is acting kind of wild and savage and biting people, um, he is tamed, right? He is civilized, just like just like we can tame our own hunger, just like we can control our hunger to make sure that we don't eat all of our food and then starve later, this young man can be tamed as well, right? The people can give him things from the human world and teach him, and he can be civilized. And so this ceremony of kind of bringing this young man into the cannibal society is very symbolic of the way that the Kwakwakwak kind of live their lives and how they manage their food. But also, it's also kind of a metaphor or a symbol for how the Kwakwakwak can live together. And so if you think about it, we've all got things inside us that are dangerous to other people, right? We can be jealous, we can be greedy, uh, we can be selfish, we can be... Um, thoughtless with people um, and all of those kind of negative things that we all have inside if we don't control them if we don't um, if, if we sort of let them out indiscriminately then they can damage other people they can hurt our ability to live together and cooperate with each other and so we have to control those things right we have to control our own selfishness and greed and anger sometimes in order to protect our ability to live as a group but the message here is that we can do it right just like we can just like we can control our hunger during the winter so that we don't starve just like we can tame this sort of savage young man and sort of bring him into the community and make him one of our own just like we can do that we can also tame the sort of negative parts of ourselves right we can tame those sort of selfish dangerous impulses and how do we do it we do it by working together right by following our rituals by telling our stories and so in that way because of that enculturation into those beliefs and ideas and because the kwakwakwak live a certain kind of life when they see that ritual that we saw and we didn't understand it, the Kwakwakwak understood, right? The Kwakwakwak see, yes, I get it. I know what this is about. I know the symbols that are happening here. I know what this ritual is meant to represent and what it's meant to communicate. And really all parts of culture are like that. All parts of culture are filled with um, very complex meanings that if you're not part of that culture, if you haven't been taught those kind of cultural values and ideas, th then you don't understand them. You don't really 
see what they're meant to communicate because it's not obvious, right? This um, cannibal bird society ritual that I've described is not really obvious what's going on until you understand the symbols, until you understand how these people live their life. And then, then the ritual makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. Does that make perfect sense? Give me a little thumbs up or thumbs down if that, if that, um, if that makes some sort of sense to you. And I'm just gonna drink coffee for 10 seconds here. Does that work for you? Does that make sense? Did I explain that okay? It's a little bit of a complicated, uh, it's a little bit of a complicated subject, but it's good, it's good. Lots of thumbs up. You see, he says thumbs up. It's all good. All right. <clears throat> okay. Good stuff. Good stuff. All right. Good. Good. All right. I'm going to do one more thing here. So that is, that's a little sort of illustration of how symbols and enculturation kind of work um, within a particular culture. But I'm gonna give you one more example too, okay? And yeah, thanks for all the thumbs up there, guys. That's really nice. Oops, I went one, one too far. All right. So everybody's good. Let's look at one more cultural practice that might have some important lessons within it, okay? And so here, I bet you I bet you thought we wouldn't talk about football in comparative culture, but here we are. Um, does anyone watch does anyone watch American football? Are there any football fans out there? Not soccer football, but American football. It's not a very big thing here in Canada. We do have a no. We do have we do have a Canadian football league, but it's not very big. There's only <clears throat> I don't know. There's eight teams or something like that. It's not a very big deal. Sorry, CFL, but it's it's not. Sometimes okay. Um, American football, I think, is kind of an interesting sport because it's just not doesn't seem to have a lot of interest outside of the U.S. Um, you know, again, it's not like soccer or sort of standard football where basically the entire world plays it um, <clears throat> even hockey seems to have uh, you know Canada and the US and then places in Europe and Russia that like to play hockey but um, American football is kind of interesting because it just doesn't have a lot of not a lot of fans outside of the country um, but for that reason we can look at this sport and try to learn some cultural lessons from it because again, the Americans love it, right? It's a hugely important thing in American culture. Um, the NFL is very important to a lot of people in the US um, and even college football teams. Um, large numbers of people show up to watch college football games. There's a lot of money involved. Um, it's a really big deal, um, which, is kind of, which is kind of funny because uh, in Canada, nobody cares about college football at all it's a total it's it, it's it's of so little importance i don't even know i don't even know if ubc has a football team they might i've never heard of them um, i'm from university of alberta and i know we have the golden bears just because i went there i never went to a game um, so it's, it's really unimportant here in canada but in the u.s it's a big deal so <clears throat> if we look at these football players here that are on the screen um, a couple things that we can tell about them. First of all, I think it's pretty interesting that, well, first of all, we can tell that they are all men, right? There's no, I don't think there's any question about the fact that these are all men, right? And they all look big and tough. And we can kind of look at their silhouette and we see that they've got a very kind of stereotypical male silhouette. They've got kind of narrow hips and they've got sort of big shoulders, big arms, big head, right? So 
it's a very exaggerated version of what men are sort of supposed to look like. Um, and so that itself might tell us something, a little something about what men are sort of supposed to be or what's desirable for men in American culture. It might tell us that Americans like their men kind of big and strong and muscly, which if you look at lots of action movies, you'll often also see, right? So here we have a bunch of male players and their, their maleness is being exaggerated, right? So not only are they big, strong, tough guys, um, but their equipment, their padding um, emphasizes that, right? Their, the helmet and the big shoulder pads and things like that. Um, <clears throat> it's also kind of interesting that we can't see any of their faces, right? And I'm not sure... I'm not sure if they've kind of been photoshopped out or if they're wearing kind of visors underneath there. I'm not sure. Um, but none of their jerseys have names on them either. And so their personal identities is not very important, it would seem, right? It seems like their, member, their membership as part of the team is the most important thing and their individual identities are not. Um, but yeah, we can see that these guys are very male uh, and we definitely get a feeling of kind of physical strength being important. And so all of these guys are standing there with their hands on their hips looking, looking very tough and intimidating, right? But of course, men are not the only people at the football game. There's also women, right? And so if we look at women, women are dressed quite differently. Women are dressed in such a way as to emphasize perhaps what Americans feel is most important, right? And so um, if we were in class, I would ask you, I would ask you these things. Yeah, but here we have a bunch of cheerleaders, right? And so most of, I think we would agree that most cheerleaders um, that we see are, they're young, right? They're pretty. Um, they're sort of often kind of smiling and jumping and dancing around. And so this might give us a clue as to what Americans feel is important for women, right? And so these women are all young, of course, right? There's no 60-year-old cheerleaders as far as I'm aware. Um, these women are all young. They're all attractive. They're all in um, good physical shape. And they're wearing things that emphasize their femininity, right? So all of these um, cheerleading costumes are either very kind of tight fitting or they show lots of skin to sort of um, emphasize the femininity of these, of these women, right? So again, that might tell us a little bit, a little something about what Americans kind of desire or feel is important for women, right? We have, for the men, we have strength and power um, and sort of toughness and here we have kind of friendliness and energy and youth and beauty right all of these are being the the, the male football players are communicating some messages about being a man and these women are communicating some messages about being a woman Interestingly, in this photo, they're, <clears throat> they're all blonde haired as well. Um, I didn't really mean for that to happen, but um, you might want to add that to the list of things too. I don't know. It was just an accident. Um, we could also look at the different roles that these people, that these two genders play at the football game. So at a football game, we know that the male players are on the field and they're the ones playing the game of football they're the ones scoring the points and ultimately they're the ones that are either winning or losing the game but for women that's not their role right they don't really have the ability to score any points for the team their role is very much uh, marginalized right their their role is to be on the sidelines cheering on the team um, they're not meant to make a direct contribution to the game of football. They're there basically to support the men, right? And so that might tell us something interesting too about traditionally American culture and what the role of men and women are. And so 
it might lead us to believe that traditionally Americans have felt that men are the ones who sort of go out into the world and sort of bring home the bacon, if you will. Um, men are the ones who, um, men are the ones who are kind of out there in the workplace or in the sort of greater world, sort of doing battle and sort of winning or losing. And what the football game might tell us is that traditionally it was preferred that the woman's place was not sort of in the world of work, but on the sides, right? Supporting, supporting her, supporting her man. And again, I'm definitely not saying that that's the way it um, is now. And I'm definitely not saying that's the way that it should be. Um, but I am saying that this state of affairs here might reflect um, Americans' traditional ideas about the role of men in society and the role of women in society. Um, the last thing I'll say about this football thing for now is um, what they used to do, I'm not really sure if they do this anymore, I think um, my example is a little bit dated, but at one point, I think in, in colleges, they used to do what was called a powder puff football game. And so what would happen apparently, I've never seen one of these because I don't watch football, but apparently what would happen is that the women, the cheerleaders, they would play a game of football. And so the girls would show up, they would put on like the helmet and the equipment and you know the black stuff under their eyes that they're supposed to put on. And they would go out there and play a game of football. And the men would dress up as cheerleaders on the side and cheer on the girls. Now, if I asked you, well, I will ask you, do you think, do you think the girls were serious? Do you think they, they played a really hard game of football? Or do you think they just kind of goofed around and didn't really try that hard? What do you think? Did the girls try hard or did they not? Even though you may have never seen a game like this, what do you think? So the girls put on all the football equipment, they go out there and they play a game of football. Are they serious? Do they, do they take it seriously? Do they try hard? Do they try to win? Or do they just kind of goof around and do whatever? Um, Okay, they tried. Who is lying again? I forget who you are. Sorry, if you use if you use another name, it's uh, I have to remember, and I <clears throat> I don't remember at the moment. Um, yeah, why not? Sam says maybe they tried hard, but I feel like they also goof around, and maybe they goofed around a little bit. Um, let me see. Uh, it's still a game regardless of gender. That's true. Oh, it's Sarvish. Okay, I'm sorry. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, it is still a game. Uh, Siobhan says, yeah, I think they tried. Uh, Karen says, I think they tried. Okay. Um, you are... Michael says, I think they tried hard. Good. Yeah. Um, you are right. They, they actually do. The girls go out there again with the equipment and the whole thing and they try to play a tough game of football and they do they the girls can play football right um now what about the guys on the sideline do you think the guys took their their job as cheerleading seriously do you think they tried to do a good job cheerleading what do you think Did they did they try to did they try to do a good credible job cheerleading or did they just kind of horse around? Michael says he doesn't think they tried. Uh, Eliana says don't doesn't think so. Um, Shafan says no. <clears throat> it's so interesting how probably none of us have seen this happen, and yet all of us have. Ying says no. All of us have a very instinctive, intuitive idea of what would happen. KC says no. Um, think they goof around. Yeah, again, you are correct. Your intuitions are correct, people. <clears throat> the men don't try hard. And if you've seen, 
if you've seen any cheerleading and particularly if you've seen modern cheerleading um, modern cheerleaders are outstanding right they're basically gymnasts they're flipping around and they're being thrown in the air and um, huge amounts of practice and effort go into cheerleading today um, but you're right the guys don't do any of this stuff they horse around um, maybe they're too lazy um, but really what's happening here really what this powder puff game shows us is the value of contribution between these two genders right so in the football game I think we established that men's contribution to the game is, is seen as the important one right it's the men who are on the field the men who are scoring the points the men who are winning the game and so because their contribution is seen as important when the women get a chance to make that contribution they take it seriously right they work hard they go out there and they play a tough game of football which they can do um, <clears throat> But the guys at the same time, they don't feel the same pressure to live up to the example that the women set because the women's contribution isn't seen as that important. And so the guys don't try hard to cheer on the women. They just horse around and act ridiculous, right? And you can probably imagine if they were dressed in some of the outfits that the girls wear, they probably look ridiculous, but they don't really try very hard. They just goof around. And, Again, it shows us that that's because of the football game, the man's contribution is seen as much more important than the woman's contribution. And it leads us to ask the question about traditional American society. Is it the same way? Is men's contribution to anything seen as more important than women's contributions? And so when women do something that traditionally men do, do they feel a lot of pressure to do a good job? And when men do something that women traditionally do, they don't really feel the need to work that hard because that contribution isn't respected, right? And so I'll kind of leave that to you to decide whether you agree with that or not. But an anthropologist would look at this game and say, gosh, I think... Um, I think we're seeing some evidence of some cultural beliefs or cultural norms of Americans being reflected in the football game, right? Um, <clears throat> if you play football or if you play any sport, you'll probably recognize something like this, right? This is a, um, a playbook or a play chart, right? And so normally the coach will draw this up and he'll... <clears throat> put it in front of the players and he'll say, okay, guys, this is what we're gonna do. When we get the ball, this position is gonna move here and this position is gonna move there and um, the play will be kind of coordinated or organized, right? And this might tell us something as well, right? You can see on the chart here that all of these, uh, all of these players, all of these little colored circles, um, they all have letters on them and all of those letters are their position right so we've got defensive tackles and defensive ends and offensive linebackers i think don't quote me here i, I don't watch football there's a quarterback and a halfback and a fullback um, <clears throat> there's some wide receivers out on the end there and so all of these guys have a position to play right and so that might tell us something about how americans see the world of work as well so if you want to be successful you have to do your job you have to play your position and so if you're a wide receiver your job is to run to the other end of the field and try to catch the ball and get a touchdown right if you're um if you're oh man what am i if you're a halfback or a fullback i had to I had to check the cheat sheet there. If you're a halfback or a fullback, your job is not to do that. It's not to run to the other end and try and catch the ball. Your job is to defend the quarterback and make sure nobody tackles him, right? So everybody has a position to play and everybody needs to do their job, play their position, and 
to listen to the boss, right? To listen to the coach. That's how you get ahead, right? That's how you succeed is you listen to your boss and you do your job. That's how it's, that's how it works in football. And maybe that's how it works in the world of business as well. So even though we might look at a football game and say, well, whatever, it's just a football game. Um, an anthropologist might look at it and say, well, actually it's not. Um, it's actually full of potential sort of cultural lessons. And perhaps the reason why the Americans like it so much is because it reflects their own cultural messages back to them. It makes sense to them in a way that it doesn't make sense to other societies because, because it is so American, right? And the thing that makes it American is the sort of cultural lessons, right? The, the way that the game has been constructed to be um, somewhat symbolic or somewhat metaphorical about their society as a whole, maybe. Again, you could, you could argue one way or the other, but, um, but an anthropologist might look at a game like football and say, actually, some things in this game are very reflective of the society that created it just like the chess game, and just like the Kwakwakwak ritual, where we see that cultural lessons are actually part of that um, part of that ritual. And if we understand the culture and we understand the symbols, then the ritual itself makes sense to us, just like the chess game and just like the football game. Okay, how's that? Is that cool? Does anyone have any questions? about that or anything yes no maybe so okay Jimmy's good that's awesome So two no's. Um, that took a little longer than I thought it was going to, but that's um, but that's okay. Chess example, okay, good. Glad you liked it. KC's good. Ying's cool. Okay, everybody's good. Um, yeah, that took a little longer to to get through than I than I thought, but that's okay. Um, tomorrow we will pick up on this. I think I I have a tiny little assignment that I'd like you to do tomorrow. It's not a big deal. Uh, or I'll, I'll give you tomorrow anyway. Um, it'll be really simple, but um, I, I think I'll give that to you tomorrow. Um, otherwise, everybody looks pretty, pretty good, pretty good, pretty good. Okay. Well, as usual, um, if you have questions or if you need to talk to me, you can always talk to me through Microsoft Teams. Uh, I'm usually I'm usually accessible, and um, other than that, I think I'll leave it there, um, and I'll talk to y'all tomorrow. Okay, so thanks for being here. Uh, are these live streams going to be up? Um, yes, they are, and I think they I think they should be. It's sometimes, uh, Aliana. Sometimes it takes a few minutes for them to sort of I think get converted and posted, um, but. I think after after they're done, there's a little bit of a processing period, and then they appear. I think um, if they don't if they don't appear, let me know. But I think I'm pretty sure that they that they go up shortly after. Um, yeah. Okay. Other than that, I think I'm going to I think I'm going to sign off. So thank you all for being here today and participating. Um, yeah. Have a good day or night, and I'll talk to you later. Okay. So. Bye.